I think back when I was a kid, there was a, a special time of the year when something would come in the mail and I really looked forward to it. Now, for a younger generation, this is going to be a, a, a different language to you because this is back in the day when we operated with paper and ink, and I would always look forward to the arrival of the Sears Christmas Catalog. Now, the Sears Christmas Catalog is what I would do to, to make my shopping list for the things that I wanted my parents to buy me for Christmas. Now, today we have Amazon list and we do it all online, but there's nothing like opening up that Sears catalog. And what I would do is I would fold the pages down and I would circle and check the things and I would have this massive list of the things that I wanted my parents to buy for me for Christmas. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting, but Christmas is that time of year where there is a whole lot of buying going on. As a matter of fact, the average American will spend excuse me, $920 per person on Christmas gifts this year, 2019. Now, it's interesting as we continue in our series, the Advent series, Consuming Christmas. Last week we saw the fasting. This week we're going to be talking about the buying. But God's Word gives us perspective about buying, the buying side of this consuming Christmas. But before we get into the Word today, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that you speak to things that are very real and practical in our lives. That your word is not some irrelevant book written thousands of years ago, but your word is true and it has relevant messages for us today so that how we may live well spiritually and how we may live well in this world. So would you guide us today and open our minds to the truth of your word so that your spirit might imply, apply it in our lives that we would be different as a result of having spent time in your presence and in hearing your word. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, once again, as we're doing this sermon series on Advent, Consuming Christmas, it's a, a break from our uh, Surprise by Jesus, we'll, which we will pick back up at the beginning of the new year. So as you can imagine with the topical uh, sermon, I'm going to be jumping around a little bit with Scripture. So I wanted to give you a main idea to hold on to. And the main idea that we're going to take away from the message today of, of the buying side of Consuming Christmas is that getting stuff does not give us peace. Now today is the second candle of Advent, and the Murray family read about the, the candle of peace. And as we're talking about buying, it's something that we know innately, but we need to be reminded consistently of the fact that getting stuff, getting things, does not give us peace. Well, last week we looked at the first in the series of Consuming Christmas, and we talked about feasting, and that was about consuming food and, and satisfying the hungers of our, of our heart. And this week we look at Consuming Christmas, we're talking about the buying as it relates to things, so consuming things. And we begin with the awareness concerning the dangers of consumerism. You know, the dangers of consumerism are very real because often we live in a society that puts an emphasis on that consumption. But consumerism can become that temptation to accumulate material things and it can be a trap. And so we're going to look at several passages, but I want to uh, camp out uh, at first in Luke chapter 12, verses uh, 13 through 21. So if you have a Bible, you can follow along in your Bible or on a device or on screen as we read through this. Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. It says, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetedness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, uh, a land, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all of my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods and laid, uh, laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not, is not rich towards God. 
Now, I could spend the whole sermon just expositing this passage, but like I said, we're dealing a little bit topically today, so I'm not going to go into my normal depth as we look at this particular aspect of the Word, but there are three principles that we can draw from this particular passage. And the first one is measuring our worth by our things is one of the dangers that we see from consumerism. In verse 16, we see that there can be uh, an identity that's related to the things that we consume. It says, and I told them a parable. And he said, the, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. You see, the man, he was identified as a rich man. His identity was caught up in his wealth, what he possessed. He had land, he had crops, he had uh, storehouses, and he had lots of things. And so he had this identity of thinking that his worth was measured by the things that he had. There's an Old Testament way of thinking that was very common in the, in the Middle East, and that was that God blesses those who have a lot of things. And so they would look at a person and say, oh, that person has possessions, so they, um, they must be okay. They must be okay with God. A person would say to themselves, well, if I'm rich, I, I have stuff, then God's love me. So if that's the case, I must be a good person because I have a lot of possessions. And then the contrary was true in thinking, and that is, well, if I don't have stuff, then God doesn't love me, and I must be a bad person. And they would use this lens to evaluate people. So rich people were good, and because God blessed them, and bad people were poor because God didn't bless them with the material. But see, that's not a a biblical thinking. That's a consumer mentality, because people were gathering their worth from the things that they own. They used the things as a measure for what their value was before God. You know, if you've been watching the news, you may have heard with some of the discussions from the the presidential candidates talking about a wealth tax. And a wealth tax is really, by the way, I'm not going political, this is just for illustration purposes, is the evaluating the, the totality of one's possessions to determine their net worth. And so they're going to tax you based on your net worth. So what that is, is there's an evaluation of what you own as to see how much you are worth. But the thing is, is that our worth in God's eyes is not determined by our wealth. You see, our wealth is equal across the board. No matter how many things we possess, no matter how rich you are, no matter how poor you are, Your net worth before God is the same because your net worth is not measured by your possessions, but by the cost, the price that was paid for you. And that price that was paid for each and every person is the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ was spilled on the cross to pay for the sins of all people. And so the net worth of every person on the planet is the same. It's measured by the blood of Jesus. And when we look at that evaluation of our having equal worth in the sight of God, it helps us avoid the trap of consumerism of evaluating our own worth based on how much or how little we have. But not only is there the danger of consumerism of measuring our worth by our things, there's also the challenge of measuring our happiness by our things. This plays into the area of contentment. You know, one of the, there's a common misconception that the more stuff I have, the better it is. So more is better. But there's a challenge with that because when you have more, it leads to complexity. And there is a certain satisfaction in simplicity of life. Now, I can relate very personally to this. When Sandra and I were getting ready to go overseas for the first time, we packed all of our worldly possessions to move to Africa for seven years, and we had them in, was it 21 boxes, sweetheart? 21 boxes uh, that we had all, and and half of those boxes were books. And so we, we were just very mobile. And so we never had a whole lot of possessions. But you know, the nice thing was, is when it was time to move or time to leave, we didn't have a whole lot of stuff. And then we come back to the United States and we started accumulating stuff. And life got a lot more complex. And sometimes we would be in Florida thinking, you know, Lord, why don't you just lead us back overseas? We enjoyed the simplicity of life, of not having so many things. And it wasn't that constant challenge of, of evaluating what somebody else has and what I don't have 
and therefore influencing my happiness by the things that I had or didn't have. And that's the challenge and the danger of consumerism, of measuring our happiness by our things. But Scripture offers a cure for this uh, common misconception of happiness is found in things, and that's found in the book of Philippians. And there's a passage in uh, chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. It says, Paul says, Not that I am speaking of need, for I have learned that in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Then he concludes with, I can do all things through him, Christ, who strengthens me. It's a beautiful anecdote. This cure for the, the danger of consumerism is to look to the sufficiency of Christ who gives us strength. Paul said, I've had times where I've had a lot of stuff. And there are times when I've had very little stuff. But in either situation, I learned to be content because my focus was not on the things, but on my identity in Christ who gives me strength. What a good message for us at this time of year. when We're inundated by this buy, 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 and we can be consumed by Christmas. And so rather than being consumed by Christmas, we can be consumers of Christmas by experiencing the joy of Christmas when we are freed from measuring our worth, our happiness by the things that come this way. But there's also a third danger of consumerism, and that is measuring our bondage by things. And that's the negative side, is that we can see that the things that we have can sometimes become chains that hold us down. You know, there's the bondage that can come with things, because often it can result to acquire these things. Unfortunately, it can lead to debt, and they can also lead to a false sense of assurance. You know, earlier I said that the average American will spend $920 a year per person, uh, $920 per person for gifts this Christmas, but one in four Americans will go into debt this Christmas with an average debt of $554 after the holidays. And so there's a, the aspect of, of the bondage of debt that can come when we are caught up in this consumer culture. And so we need to avoid that consumerism so that we don't become slaves to the things that we own. Buying becomes bondage because there can be that buying material things which holds us down. You know, what have you bought that keeps you or prevents you from buying in to something that is more significant in your life? Now, there's a big difference between buying and consuming things and buying in, which is being a stakeholder, making a calculated decision based on value and conviction that will impact you presently and also produce dividends for a future investment. The buying in saying, I'm not just consuming this, but I'm investing myself because I see that this is a worthy cause to which to invest myself. Uh, it's, it's a worthy purchase to invest in because it's not just about the, the temporary. There's a long-term benefit from that. But there's also not just the, the, the question of am I buying and consuming or am I buying into an idea that's larger. There's also the aspect of buying that relates to a philosophy or the immaterial aspect. Sometimes we have bought into philosophies and we don't even know it. There's a philosophy of materialism, and that is the accumulation of things. And so we see the things, but we don't realize, no, it's not about the things. It's about the mindset, which leads to the purchase of things constantly. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that having things are bad or that having money is bad. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I'm just saying we have to evaluate what is the basis for why we do what we do and what is the driving force behind these factors. And so we can buy into a philosophy. It can be materialism. It can be humanism. There can be a philosophy that we bought into. And often the churches are filled with people who bought into religious legalism. And that's a, that's a trap too, and that's bondage. There can be a philosophy of existentialism, which is basically a fancy way of saying, I'm living for the present and for the current experience. And that's the philosophy. All that matters is what I'm doing to satisfy my current needs and feelings, that experience, the existential realities that are going on. 
These are all things which we can buy or are we going to buy into the biblical principles, things that are lasting? Are we going to buy into the things of God which will satisfy the hungers of our soul and satisfy the needs that we have as well? You know, once those we, we understand the danger of consumerism and that the dangers of consumerism are exposed, then we can approach Christmas with appropriate consumption. And the second point with appropriate consumption, that's related to the importance of obtaining the immaterial valuables versus the consumer products. The immaterial valuables are the things that last, and that is how we can consume Christmas in an appropriate way. I think of uh, Proverbs 23, 23. It's a very short verse, but it's very deep. It says, buy truth. Do not sell it. Buy wisdom, instruction, and understanding. Buy truth. And don't sell it. Buy wisdom, instruction, and understanding. You see, these things which we're commanded to buy in Proverbs are not material things to amass, but they are, are, are the immaterial values which can sustain us through time. It's often we look falsely to the things that, are, that we're able to grab onto, that we're able to touch and to feel, that really cannot provide the dur durable, what I'm, what's the word I'm looking for? The durable satisfaction that we need that the immaterial can provide for us. As we look at this aspect of appropriate consumption, we need to understand the difference between a need and a greed. Now, you've heard that phrase before, you know, satisfy your needs, not your greeds. But it's important to understand this because the wants that we have, those desires, those, those greeds that we have, can distort our perspective. The things that we desire, the things that we want, can change our perspective in a way that keeps us from seeing the proper value and the proper um, priorities of things in life. But if you have an appropriate desire then we can see it can give us deeper insight. And that's why the, the author of the Proverbs said, buy truth, don't sell it. Buy wisdom, buy instruction and understanding. Because if we have those things, then it allows us to have a proper perspective on our lives. It, has, it helps us to have a proper perspective on people and have a proper perspective on things. And what this will do is this will help us to, to make the, the correct assessment of the things that we face in life. I think of the passage in Matthew chapter 13, verses 45 and 46. Jesus is speaking. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant searching a uh, search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, this is a parable. You might say, well, hey, isn't that reinforcing the whole aspect of consumerism? He's, he's going out and he's buying pearls. Well, no, Jesus is speaking of an, an illustration, and he's using an economic illustration to show assessing relative value. He said, if you want to look for something valuable, you know, that's okay. But when you find something that is ultimately valuable, everything else pales in comparison. You sell that so that you can get the thing that's the most valuable. And the immaterial, the wisdom, the truth, the understanding, those are the things which are the most valuable, which will sustain you. And so Jesus says, tells this parable about purchase these things, buy these things. And it's buying, it means giving all that I have to all, all and all, not only all that I have, but all of who I am to all of who God is. This is, the, this is the, the high point of this parable that Jesus is saying, is that we need to give all that we have and all of who we are to all of who God is, and that is the proper way of assessing things, and that's what, the way that we have our needs met rather than our greeds met. We identify things properly, and we invest, accord, invest accordingly. The second aspect of the appropriate consumption is understanding the difference between values and valuables. We want to focus on those values and not the valuables because the things 
that we might value can distort our priorities, but appropriate attribution can protect us from impulses. So it's not about the valuables, it's about the values. Those were the things that will sustain us through the, the difficult times of life. You know, taking, it, it's, it's really taking in what not, cannot be taken away. A value is something that we take into our hearts and influences how we live. And those things that we take in, those values that we take in, cannot be taken away from us because they're not valuables which can be stolen. They become a part of who we are. So we want to take in those values which can't be taken from us versus amassing valuables which can be taken away and really aren't a part of who we are. This is the appropriate consumption of values and of those needs. And so that leads us to the question for each one of us today, where we are. What are you taking, what are you doing now to cultivate a Christ-like character in your life which will sustain you? That Christ-like character which can't be taken away, which will sustain you through the difficult times. When the world is driving you to have a consumer mentality, the Christ-like character will help you through. But that involves cultivating those Christ-like characters right now in the present. Being purposeful, being intentional about that. Because the development of the values and the development of Christ-like characters don't just take place haphazardly or by osmosis. It involves an intentional engagement of who we are and what we have so that we can experience the fullness and the intimacy of Christ in our lives. Healthy habits are something that are very good. If you start exercising, it can lower your blood pressure, lower your cholesterol, give you strength. But if you stop those habits and start you know, treating yourself poorly, those positive habits that you exercise for a period of time will not sustain you indefinitely in the future. That's why it's important to continue that ongoing cultivation of intimacy with Christ and consuming those things which are valuable for our relationship with Jesus. And the reason that we do that is because we need to understand that each one of us were bought with a very high price. We're valuable to God because of the imputed value of Jesus. I think of the love of God that was expressed in the person of Jesus Christ. Romans 5.8 says, for, But God shows, He demonstrates His love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You were bought with a price because Christ loves you. And that is, adds to our value. But because we are loved by Christ and because he loves us and he, and he has given us value, he wants us to live a life of holiness because we were bought at a great price, purchased at a great price. And the holiness of, of God is, is really highlighted in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. It says, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. To read from verse 19, it says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? whom you have from God. You are not your own. but You are bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. It's so important to understand that when we realize that we have great value before God, that is the appropriate type of consumption that we can enter into this Christmas season. That leads us to the, the third point. In a world where buying is emphasized and we can av avoid being consumed by Christmas if we understand the principle of generosity. There is freedom through the superior pathway of giving from the consumerism that can, can kill us during this time of year. There are three uh, quick points that we want to look at. The checking the attitudes and motivations, the hoarding and the overflowing. But the first aspect of checking our attitudes and motivations can really be summed up in a passage in Matthew chapter 6, verse 2. It says, Thus when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. You see, Jesus, he is addressing a situation where people would, would try to, to draw attention to themselves by saying, look, I'm giving away. Look how generous I am. 
And so people would, they would blow the trumpets and they would say, hey, look, I'm, I'm going to make a gift. Everybody look at me of how generous I am. But Jesus says, that's not the right attitude. The principle of generosity is going to be one where it's not a focus on me and what I'm doing, but because when the focus is on me and what I'm doing, then there's the reward in and of itself. But he says that's not the principle of generosity that's going to have an impact. We have to have the right motivation in which we give. We have to check our attitude. So the attitude that we should have in giving we should flow from the fact that we have received so much. When we look at the goodness of God towards us, that is why we give. Not so that we will, people will look at us and praise us for how great we are or how generous we are, but because we understand that we're poor and needy and God has given us everything that we need in Christ Jesus. So how and why it is important to be generous? Well, because... Right thinking opens the doors for the possibilities of generosity. If we've checked our attitudes and our motivations, then it opens up the doors for giving away, which will honor God. It'll help us to be joyful and when we give, not to, to give begrudgingly, but to say, guess what? I've been blessed, and so I want to show that generosity for others because I've been given so much. When we are generous, we are generous not because we have to be, but we're doing so willingly. We can do so by willingly reduce less, reduce what we consume, re consume less. And this will protect us from having a transactional mentality with God. When we give money away, when we are generous to others, we are really mocking money to say money is not going to be my idol. But I'm going to show that, it, you know, it, it's, it's saying I'm going to put things in the proper priority and my focus is on God. And so these material things are not going to be possessing me or holding me back. And that's the, the freedom. And that gives us joy to give generously. There's an aspect of generosity uh, which is hindered when we have a mentality of hoarding. And hoarding is, is uh, it, it, it's just holding on to a lot of stuff. Now I think of the word uh, miser is rooted in misery. And you now the worldly values oppose the biblical values of generosity. They encourage to conserve what you have. Look out for number one. Keep what you've got. Hold on to it. But what happens is when we are miserly and we hoard, it leads to a couple of negative problems. One is it leads to the rotting of what is good. I think of what took place in Exodus chapter 16 when God was given manna to the people of Israel. He provided abundantly this food for them in the desert on a daily basis. And he said, take as much as you want, but you have to eat it that day. So God's generosity was abounding. But when they tried to say, I'm going to hoard it and keep it to the next day, what happened? It rotted. And they couldn't keep it. So when we hoard, God is generous to us. But when we hoard, it ends up rotting and wasting away. And this can also lead to misappropriation or an unfair distribution and shortages of abundance. But see, God is generous, but when we hoard, it can have a negative impact. When we look at the New Testament, I think of uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 13 through 15. It says, For I do not mean that others should be at ease and you burden, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance in the present time should supply should." should supply their need so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it was written, whoever gathered had much, uh, had, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. And see, that passage in Corinthians is looking back to the situation of, of God's provision of manna. And so with that in the church, he's saying, look, we need to have this concept of generosity and not hoarding so that there can be a balance and needs can be met, and there can be an abundance within the community. And that's that mentality of generosity that comes when we aren't caught up in the trap of hoarding. See, this isn't a condemnation for a person who has a lot of wealth or a person that is doing well in life. But this is a recognition that we can't have a mentality of hoarding because basically that's saying, my possessions own me, and if they're taken away, then I've lost my identity, I've lost my wealth, I've lost my value, I'm not trusting in God, I'm trusting in my wealth. 
But we see that contrary to the mentality of hoarding is the principle of overflowing. Sharing the blessing with others is the antidote for being consumed by Christmas consumerism. You know, when we give as an overflow, we should do so voluntarily, not out of obligation, not out of coercion, but voluntarily as personal stewardship. An obedience that is born from love and gratitude to God, not out of a legalistic demand. And we see this taking place in the New Testament church. If you, uh, you know, We're going to have a class next week for uh, the adult enrichment, and Van is going to be moving into the second half of Ch Acts chapter 5, and then we're going to take a couple uh, weeks off for Christmas and pick back up at the beginning of the year. But I want to recommend that study in Acts. But as we have actually already studied in the beginning of Acts, in uh, chapter 2, verses 45, it talked about what was taking place in the life of the church at that time. It said, all who believed were there together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, it says, in all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You see, this giving that they showed in the New Testament church was not demanded and required, but it was done voluntarily because they saw the needs in the community. And what drives this? Love and unity of purpose is what drives this generosity, this spirit of generosity, this principle of generosity. And we see that in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. They write, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. And there was great power, and the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, Jesus. and a great grace was upon them all. And they were not, uh, there was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds that was sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as they had need. Now, this is very interesting because. Not only was the giving voluntary, it was theirs. They could do with it what they want. But the reason that they gave generously was because of love and unity. They were described as being of one heart and soul. And they were united in purpose. It says that the apostles were giving testimony of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So as we look at this season of consuming Christmas and this theme of today of buying, it's so easy to get caught up in the world's mentality of more, 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 buy, buy, buy. But we see in the New Testament that a voluntary generosity out of love and motivation to see the good news of Jesus Christ was why generosity was expressed. You see, getting stuff doesn't give us peace. But when we understand that we invest in the immaterial things and we buy those values, it changes our hearts so that we can be generous and not be owned by the possessions, but can draw near in intimacy to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So what's the next step for you? This Christmas, there could be several ways that you could apply this. For some, it might mean to buy fewer things. So that you don't become entrapped in this, this consumerism, which can become a snare. Another one might say it's to give more generously. For another, it might mean to buy the immaterial, valuable things. And when you do that and you buy the immaterial, you know what the currency is for making those purchases of the immaterial? The currency is your life. You see, Jesus wants more of you. He wants more of your life. He wants more of you, and he wants you to invest your life in the things of him that have eternal value, lasting value, that cannot be taken away. And when the things of this world, the things that, the things that we could buy, disappear, we will stand firm because we have intimacy with Christ, and we have the values. And this is the way that we can consume Christmas without being consumed by the consumerism of Christmas. 
If you've never come to know Jesus Christ, he says, come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He offers you a gift of salvation if you've never come to know him. For the rest of us, let us live in light of his great gift for us. Let us go into the Lord in prayer.